this down here. Good morning. Welcome to MED 210, Anatomy and Physiology 2, the sequel. It is the first day, week one, Wednesday, March 17. If you had me before for uh, Anatomy and Physiology 1, it's the same exact format. And um, I will put the uh, dates for the laboratories and it's in May. So the dates are just right off the top of my head is May 5 and May 12. So that's Wednesday, May 5 and May 12, 9 a.m., fourth floor, Health Lab 1, Alexandria campus. Uh, and if you can't make it, please email me uh, this week uh, or as soon as possible um, so that we can uh, talk about, um, you know, alternative things that we can do for your grade. And the uh, final examination is on Wednesday. It'll be in the same format online, Wednesday, 9 a.m., uh, May, uh, May 19th, that's your final. And your midterm is Wednesday, 9 a.m., uh, April 14. And again, all of these will be announced um, uh, here in your announcements, but I just wanna get it verbally out there so you can start looking at your schedules and planning ahead. Let's go over the syllabus. And like I said, same exact format um, as your anatomy and physiology one. And it's just a, a continuation with a, and every week is 10%, uh, uh, including the midterm and the final. And those of you who had me before, some of you had really bad grades on your midterm and final, but you still got an A. How is that possible? Because if you get like a 72 uh, on 10% of your grade and you did everything else, uh, so uh, that 72 is, let's say you did like um, 90% throughout, uh, throughout the whole term. Uh, that 72% uh, adds uh, seven more points. So you end up with a 97, so that's still an A. So uh, many of you uh, uh, had that. Um, uh, but uh, I believe uh, last term, uh, Anatomy Physiology 1, you guys did pretty good. So um, not a lot of people fell into that category. And you'll see everyone who got A's are people who consistently do their work every week. Okay. So again, we have Zoom sessions, Wednesday mornings, 9 a.m. Um, my Zoom sessions, I, I try not to go over a, an hour and a half um, uh, because you have work to do. And um, um, the work is weekly, a task and a discussion and, um, and a case study that's located in the lesson. And if you watch the video, I always will point out where the case study is so you know exactly what to click on. So we'll be focusing on this term, um, uh, immunology, that's like the first two weeks, um, both the uh, nonspecific or innate means um, you know your immunologic system that you're born with and then of course the um, uh, next week we'll be talking about specific immunity and this is all apropos to go uh, uh, regarding what's going around uh, on in this world and um, and and a lot of it's really important on how you speak to your patient uh, on uh, these things because even after a year of all this stuff, there's so much misconception about how your immune system works and how this virus works and how uh, um, I believe I believe people now are more confused than they were a year ago. Let me see if somebody I got a message. It might be a student. Okay, student in another class. Now, of course, our textbook is going to be the online textbook. And every week, 10% discussion, task, lesson, unless I say otherwise. And typically in week four, uh, I won't let you do the uh, case study because you should be studying for your, um, uh, for your midterm. And probably week nine, I won't let you do the lesson because you should be studying for your final for week 10. The discussion, same format as for those of you who are in my anatomy and physiology one, anywhere from 200 to 250 words. Um, and I'm not too, uh, um, um, there's only like four or five of you in this class. So only answer one person. And when, 
either your primary discussion post and the answer that you have to somebody, you should have evidence, at least one seventh edition APA format citation. And uh, if you still don't know how to do that, I, I don't know what else I could do for you. Uh, but you guys are pros, you should, you should be able to ace these discussions. But if you're still having trouble, give me a call and then, or you can speak to Laura DeLeon, which is our universal, university librarian. Another thing you could also do is here, if you look at your Moodle, you go up here on the top and you go into library AP uh, sources. It's really important that, um, that you be aware of what plagiarism looks like because your future professors will just give you a zero and then you do it again. Your future professors will then send you an email, CC our campus president and then you'll be in danger of failing the course. Uh, four people failed courses, one person was removed last year. So please don't be that person. And um, nine times out of 10, it's usually unintentional plagiarism, but whether intentional or unintentional, if you are utilizing um, a source that you are not citing in education, it's a big, big no-no. Um, those of you who are in nursing must maintain a B minus or better. But when you look at it, come on, 80% of the material, do you want a doctor or a nurse working on your children who only knows 80% of the material? So, you know, really strive to really get that um, uh, retention going. And a lot of it is um, time management and repetition. So if you're one of these people who, who cram everything and try to get everything done uh, Wednesday early morning or Tuesday night, before things are due, because things are due typically Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. So task one, discussion one, and uh, lesson one is due, of course, next week. And next week is, uh, today is, I believe, the 17th. So next week is the 24th. So 24th, 9 a.m. Uh, late, um, what do you call that? Uh, late protocol stand, meaning to say is for every day that you do not post, it's uh, one grade off. And in three days, you're already down to a 70 or a 60. So, you know, but at least partial credit is better than no credit. Um, this is a different way to look at it. Your tasks are 33%, um, your lesson and your labs, 33%, and your discussions. But essentially, if you look at it my way, every week is 10%. So every week, you have an opportunity to build your grade so that you know, by week five, you kind of know that whether you're passing the class or, or failing or not. But of course, I'll tell you if you're in trouble. Here on your syllabus, it, uh, it goes through everything that you're going to be covering every week. And um, it's mirrored also here on your, uh, on your uh, Moodle course shell. And if during week eight, week nine, week 10, inclement weather policy, you guys have my contact information. It's in announcements. Um, uh, so, or uh, if you have rave alert, R-A-V-E, if you don't have that, um, contact myself so I can get you in touch with Kathy Vargas, student uh, services manager to get you hooked up to rave alerts. Rave alerts tell you when the, uh, when the campus is closed. And I'll usually, whether it's closed or not, I'll usually call it uh, the night before uh, personally for, for, for my class. So always look at your announcements daily. Uh, when we're on campus, campus security, that also includes uh, COVID. And those of you who've been to my labs before know that uh, we glove in, we mask in, we stay gloved, we stay masked, and we try, to, um, uh, we try to not bring too many personal items to school. And even if you do, uh, we sequester them in the back of the room separate from everybody else. So no one should be touching anybody. Um, um, and our laboratories, uh, those of you who have attended it, I try to make it fast, an hour, uh, hour and a half tops, uh, so that, um, um, you know, so we can, uh, so we can, uh, you know, get to what we need to get to and uh, uh, decrease the uh, level of exposure. Um, honor code, that's another thing. If you want to cheat, be my guest. If I catch you, I catch you. I don't, I don't, but I... I make the same speech every term. Um, you'll get caught in the real world, and in the real world, they'll prosecute with the 
uh, with the maximum extent of the law, uh, and it will not be pretty. So it won't be just losing your job. You'll get you'll get charges, um, uh, and you'll get uh, lawsuits, that kind of thing, because this is healthcare. We touch we touch people's health, and uh, that's a really really um, that's a really really important thing. So with that with that said. Again, it's good that I recorded it because sometimes I talk a little bit fast. And um, please look on the chat. Um, let me get down. Okay, good. Just making sure I, I got the right attendance. Introduction to the course. So, and again, I record everything. You guys know that. And then I put it here in the announcements. So, um, and of course, any questions, I try to monitor the chat. Um, uh, but since it's such a small class, uh, you can unmute yourself and just uh, call out and say, hey, excuse me, uh, I got a question. Of course, here's your textbook. Uh, I don't know what this is, learning links. Uh, you could uh, try it out later. Um, uh, this is new, this term. Uh, what's not new for this term, uh, what was new last term is tutor.com. Try that out. Um, if you, as an adult, what do we always do? We try to handle things on our own. Uh, don't do that. Always call out for help. A, a, a true professional calls out for help early, calls out for help, help off, often. Um, don't just sit there at home in misery or, or at work, wherever you do your work. Uh, and don't sit there in misery and hope things will change. Always get help. Seventh APA seventh edition resources that here is uh, so as well. So you have seventh edition APA right here. You have also this library. So there's no excuse um, to not do these discussions. So task one. What's the task? Uh, download, sign, and upload the lab safety contract just like last term. And I forgot where the safety contract is. Let me. Let's check real quick. I think it's here in course introduction. Yeah, course introduction, important documents, and, and you click on this little button here, and there's lab contract right here. Okay, so you, you take that, you print it, uh, you sign it, and then take a picture of it or scan it if you have a scanner at home. Uh, and then, of course, put that in there, and that's task one. And we need that for the lab. So, but do that. Do that today. Um, discussion one. Let's look at it. CDC issued alert for Zika. I know it's a little dated, but it's the same thing, right? It's it, you, how's this? Replace Zika with Corona, right? Because uh, again, like I said, there's a lot of misconceptions, and try to link it to. You're in a 200 level class now. Try to link it to uh, today's lecture. Try to link it to what's going on in today. And if you're going to talk about Corona, I need 2021 data. Okay, 2020 uh, is a little bit old. 2021 data. We're we're well um, we're well uh, into the first quarter. There's a lot of things now that are changing. So try to get 2021 data when you're talking about. Um, uh, healthcare science and all, all that jazz and if you've had me before I was a little bit I was not a little bit I was a lot lenient I was accepting stuff from like 2015 2016 nah you're a 200 level class now so hit up 2021 data um, it, it, it'll be best for you um, to get the uh, what's the latest and Lesson, let's just point out where the lesson is before we hop on to the lecture. The lesson is right here. Click on that. That's of course due next week by 9 a.m. Lost in the desert. Um, answer this final set of case questions, uh, one through seven. Put it in a Microsoft Word document. And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, please on your, um, on your document, put your name, date, you know, the whole, the whole formal thing. Name, date, uh, with you guys it's easy. There's not many of you, there's only five or six of you. But when you have your other professors who have multiple, uh, multiple classes, they could have up to a hundred of you, um, you know, uh, and all taking the same class. And uh, 
they won't know you from Adam. So make sure you have your name, your date, and what class. And, and if you want to know the specific class, when you look up here, this is called a popcorn, um, popcorn trail. When you look up here, when you want to go back to your main page, uh, the class here in question is MED 210. LE means lecture, LA means lab, six means Wednesdays. So it goes four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for Mondays through Saturdays. D means day or morning. A means afternoon or 1 p.m. And N means evening or 6 p.m. AX is the camp, is the home campus of the professor. So if it's LELA, it's lecture and lab here, Alexandria campus, Wednesdays, 9 a.m. So now that we know all that, we got, that, we got all the, uh, uh, the pertinence out of the way, let's jump right in and let's see what we're talking about. We're talking today about the integumentary system and we're also gonna be talking about um, um, the innate um, immune system, meaning the nonspecific stuff you were born with, stuff that didn't get developed right, at, right out of the gate, which are your body defenses and protections. And let's open up, oh, I forgot to see what chapter it was. You know, you'd think by now I'd memorize all the chapters. Chapter five. So chapter five in your textbook. So we go here, go into your course textbook. Table of contents. Scroll all the way down to five, and we're here, okay? So when you look at skin, it's not just a covering. It's way more than that, and it plays several different roles. It has several different layers. It also has accessory structures that uh, relate to its role. So skin is not just a covering, right? It has a whole bunch of functions and we're, we're going to talk about it in a moment. And because this class is anatomy and physiology. So how does, uh, what are the parts and how does it work? So right off the bat, this is a beautiful shot right here. Lovely first question on a midterm. Because can I erase all of these and just ask you to identify everything? That's a hair. That's a muscle called your erecti pili muscle. It is associated with hair shaft and your hair follicle, right? Uh, so when you get cold or scared, your hair on your skin stands up. Well, there's a muscle associated with that and that's your erecti pili muscle. So you can see now that the skin, it's in layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. The hypodermis is also known as subcutaneous tissue. And you could see here, it's a living, breathing thing because it has, see this red tube? That's an artery. It takes oxygen to the skin. Here's a vein, is blue. And they're not really red and blue in real life. We guys already know that we use these conventions um, to, to identify structures in a diagram. So if I pointed this, this is a vein and that takes, that takes carbon dioxide away from this system here because the system requires energy in the form of oxygen. Then the energy gets spent away and then what are we carrying away? Carbon dioxide. You could see that just like a shielding, it comes in layers and to protect you. Okay. Uh, what else? Sebaceous gland. Sebum, S-E-B-U-M, is oil. And it keeps this hair soft and supple. When you get older, you have less oil, you have less water, the hair gets what? Brittle, okay? And of course, hair follicle. You could see why it hurts if I pull your hair because look what it's all associated with. See these little uh, wires here? Those are nerves. Here, you got another set of nerves here too that control the erector, uh, erector pili. So if these nerves here, you have your uh, Pacinian corpuscle and you also have uh, Meisner's, which is another set. Pacinian is for deep. Meisner is for, um, is, is more up here. 
like this nerve like here. It's more of a soft touch here. When you sense that you're cold, what happens? Your brain sends a signal to this uh, sensory nerve fiber here, right? Well, this is, um, this one, they say this is a sensory, but this one's motor. This is mislabeled. Your pacinian is a sensory, but this one's motor, and how do I know? It's connected right to a muscle. So if your pacinian corpuscle starts um, identifying that you're cold, it'll send a message, a sending tract up to your brain. Your brain says, oh, you know what? The erector pili should start pulling on these muscles to get, to get uh, you know, to cut the wind, you know, uh, the wind and the cold in my, in my skin. So it'll send a message from the brain to this motor nerve fiber right into this uh, muscle and the muscle is going to pull that hair straight up and that also happens when you're scared or when you know you know when you get the chills you when you think there's a ghost in the room or something like that i don't know don't get me started on ghosts i have a whole lecture on that so the layers epidermis dermis and hypodermis the epidermis right is epi your prefix meaning superficial on the top dermis that's the main and the hypodermis do you notice on the epidermis there are no nerves and there are no arteries and veins that's why uh when me and my sister were kids you could stick you know pins and needles through this layer and would you have blood nope would you feel anything nope and uh, you know, five-year-old Nelson thought that was uh, hilarious. But what happens when you play the game and then you dig too deep and hit one of these nerves? Then you will feel the pain. And that's at the, that starts at the level of the dermis. Now, the level of the hypodermis, also known as your subcutaneous tissue, what does it have? Fat. Fat here is not only for storage of glucose, it provides a nice um, uh, insulation to your body and to your skin. And it also has a nice cushioning effect uh, 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 on your skin. Here's an eccrine sweat gland. So that's another function of your skin, thermal regulation. Now with your sweat, do you guys ever notice, even if you don't drink or smoke, you go to a bar, right? And then uh, right before, when you go home, Right. Let's say you were having dinner at this bar. You go home. You smell yourself. Doesn't it smell like smoke and smoke and alcohol? Because you got exposed to that. So what did the skin do? It formed as a filter. And one of the ways that we can get rid of, uh, um, you know, uh, poisonous things or things that uh, um, may be foreign to the human body, like smoke and um, you know uh, the smell of alcohol, you could sweat it out. Uh, um, those of you who know that I've been a DJ for 30 years and every time I come home, uh, I smell like the entire bar and my wife always gets annoyed. She's like, she says to me like, oh my God, were you smoking weed? And I'm like, no, I'm not smoking weed. I'm a medical professional. I don't smoke weed. Right. But you get exposed to that smoke. It gets soaked up into the skin. The skin, uh, utilizes, uh, uh, all that, um, uh, all that smoke, um, and then what will happen? It, it's considered a toxin, and your sweat will sweat it out. That's why even if you have just a single beer, uh, your clothes will reek. It'll, it'll, it'll smell, smell like a brewery. So let's, let's, uh, let's have a quick overview, overview on what functions that we talked so far. So there's an immunologic function. The skin, when it's intact, keeps all the bad things all out here because do you want all the pathogens anywhere near any of these nerves, arteries, or veins? Because what happens when, um, like for example, there's a whole bunch of Staphylococcus aureus um, bacteria all over your skin. That's why we disinfect your skin anytime we do surgery or venipuncture, you know, when we take your blood. Because if any of the stuff on the outside gets in here, don't you think it can go right here and then go into my systemic blood, then you're gonna get sepsis. That's why those of you who had my class before know that I do not, I uh, am not a fan of the Department of Surgery because when you do surgery, I'm cutting into this protective function. 
another function that we already knew is what? Hair and the sebaceous gland keeps your hair and your skin uh, soft and smooth, right? Because of its oil, the sebum, right? And it also has thermal regulation. When you get hot, what happens? You have sweat glands. And then last but not least, the sweat glands also uh, provide like a filtration uh, 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 service uh, to any noxious fumes or um, you know, uh, any particulate matter that uh, comes into contact with the skin. So right now, just in this last 10 minutes, you'll now see how complex the skin is and how it's more than just a covering. It's a living, breathing thing with layers. And what can I do? Can I have this picture and then just erase all this and A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Yep. It's easy, isn't it? Now, another thing that the uh, uh, that the skin has, you have thick skin and you have thin skin. Now your thick skin has one more layer than your thin skin. And I want you to know that thick skin, there are certain places on your body where the skin has to be thicker than, uh, than everywhere else, like your palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Now the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet have in their epidermis and we're going to go over the layers, an extra layer. And that's the lucid layer or the clear layer known as the stratum lucidum. Now the stratum lucidum is thick skin. That's a, this, this is a common anatomy and physiology question. Like what's the difference between thick and thin skin? It's an extra fifth layer in the epidermis called your stratum lucidum. Another thing about your, um, um, the basal layer or the first layer of your epidermis is it has these cells called keratinocytes. Keratinocytes make this protein called keratin, and that's what makes your skin tough. If you recall the anatomy and physiology lab, remember uh, when we were uh, messing around with the piggies, we tried to rip the skin with our, with, with our gloved hands? It wasn't easy. It, it's not easy because in the basal layers or the stratum basale, in your epidermis, there are keratinocytes that make keratin and that keratin, that's what gives your hair, your nails, um, not only water resistant properties, but it gives it that hardness. So doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? I think so. And right here is a lovely diagram of your epidermis. Now, do you think I could also erase all of this? A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Yup. So we just talked about the basal layers or the stratum basale, right? What did it have? It had a lot of keratinocytes, right? Keratin, where's the, uh, here, right? So that's what gives it tough. Now, the thing about this is the more, the, the deeper you get, the younger the cell. And the more superficial you get when you get up to the stratum corneum, and this is how I remember it. It looks like cornflakes, right? And these cells are dead. That's why, you, that's why, you know, when you scratch your skin, you get all ashy, right? Well, this is it. This is your ashiness source. Because these are dead skin cells that just flake off. And all day, right, especially if, uh, you, you know, you, uh, you shower and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, wash regularly, right, this, this layer get, will keep on getting replaced by these other layers. And remember the stratum lucidum is your fifth extra layer for thick skin. You have your stratum granulosum that has all these granule, granules in it, in their cells. And what else is also important? In your basal stratum basale, uh, you have melanocytes. Melanocytes uh, uh, release a chemical called melanin. The function of melanin, again, is the protection of the skin against UV radiation. That's why we are all of different colors because genetically, uh, if you're lighter skinned and blue eyes, your genetics are from, uh, you know, the poles, uh, you know, a more colder place. And that, those colder places on, the, uh, on our planet, they're not exposed to UV radiation, not as much as people who have genetics from locations closer to the equator. So if you're closer to the equator you're, uh, or your, your, your family history and your family genetics, 
you'll have more melanocytes. Um, and uh, people who have more color in their skin have more melanocytes and they have better protection against UV radiation. Now, not to say that if you're, you have dark skin that you won't, like if you're in the sun enough, you won't be predisposed to um, stuff like basal cell carcinoma or skin cancer, but you'll have a less chance because who gets basal cell carcinoma, who gets skin cancer uh, more often is people who have less melanocytes or people who have fairer skin. So again, epidermal layer, it's on the top, the very, very top letter, the stratum corneum. That's where you have dead skin cells. That's when they flake off. Lucidum, that's the extra fifth layer for the thick skin. And uh, the stratum basale has two very important cells, melanocytes and keratinocytes, and know what they, uh, know what they do. Now, you see this? This is a sensory neuron, and this is called a Merkel cell. So this is, um, remember we talked about um, there was um, the Pacinian corpuscle was deep, well, Merkel cells and this sensory neuron is what? Superficial. But you can see it's all the way in the basal layer. So I could stick a needle through all of this and I won't feel anything. But if the needle gets deep and I, and I touch this, you're going to feel it. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. What else is important? We also have um, Langerhans cell. That's a macrophage. So it eats up bacteria, foreign particles, because remember, the skin is exposed to a lot of nasty things, especially the epidermis. So we have these things called Langerhans cells and they're macrophage. Um, they're, they're not smart, Langerhans cells. Macrophages aren't smart. Uh, they, they attack just things that don't look right. So they have to identify, if it identifies the cell as not being part of your skin, it'll just totally eat it up. Um, hence the term macrophage. Macro means large, phage means eating. So the Langerhans cell, and that is in uh, your epidermis and specifically where? Here in your stratum spinosum. But you know, I won't go that. Uh, I won't ask you where, where exactly is it, uh, but I will ask you, what is the function of Langerhans cell? And you'll tell me immunologic, it's a macrophage, it eats up a uh, foreign body and bacteria. Now, we already talked about keratinocytes and keratin, right? And what does it do? Makes things like your nails and your skin hard slash waterproof, okay? Uh, let's now go a little bit deeper. The deeper, the dermis, that's like the main part of the skin, right? And uh, the epidermis is the very, very top part. And the dermis is the middle part. Now, what's so important about the middle part? Well, the middle part is the, it's the glue. It holds everything together. And what, what does it have? You can see here, there's a papillary layer. Papilla means um, fingers. So do you see how it goes like this and forms these fingers? So it will like, act as a glue to keep the epidermis, the top part, right? This part, see, look familiar, right? And the middle part, which is the dermis, uh, together. It also has elastin and elastic fibers. We also kind of saw that when we were in dissection, when we were playing around with the skin. Now the hypodermis, also known as subcutaneous tissue, that's where you have lipid. The function of lipid or fat is to store glucose but it also has wonderful properties like um, it, uh, it acts like a shock absorber. It also acts like a, um, um, an insulator, okay? So to keep yourself warm. But again, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. Too little of a lipid is a bad thing. Everything should be where? In the middle. Here's just an example of um, uh, melanocytes. Okay, right. here's different moles. Moles are typically benign, uh, 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 benign cancers. But again, if you look at the skin pigmentation of these patients, they're more on the light um, 
uh, they're more light skinned, have less melanocytes. And if you look at their history as well, they're people who have jobs or people who love to be outdoors. Um, so that's why when you look at, you know, those workers who uh, work on a highway, a uh, good friend of mine, my, my boy, Philly B, uh, my boy, Phil is an engineer and he, uh, he works, you know, he's with those highway people who survey, um, even on the hottest day, they wear gloves, um, they wear reflective gear, they wear goggles and they have a mask covering their face because they're there exposed to the sun and UV radiation can go through clouds. So even on today, like today, it's a cloudy day, um, uh, you could still get exposed. Um, this is an example of people who have, um, they have a, a genetic problem where uh, their melanin or the uh, melanocytes uh, don't produce um, an equal amount of melanin. So you can see here, this is called vitiligo. That's why when Michael Jackson was alive and he said he had vitiligo, I'm like, that's not vitiligo. You got your skin bleached. Vitiligo is this. It's like this. It's patchy. Um, he did it for a whole bunch of reasons we're not going to get into. But he made Thriller. You got to like it. Got to love him. He had, he had a chimpanzee. Uh, eh, nice to know. We already uh, um, saw this picture. Uh, hair growth, nice. Just know that hair is a protein. It's actually like a, a whole bunch of super coiled proteins. So exposing your hair to anything that breaks down proteins, like extreme heat, it tends to mess with it. Or any of the chemicals that, uh, that uh, everyone puts um, uh, in their hair to make it look cool or make it look a, like a wonderful color, it's gonna do ridiculous amounts of damage. Um, your nails. Remember we talked about keratin. Now what's important about the nails is, is that this nail bed here, it's important because it protects your fingers because your fingers bang, up, bang against a whole bunch of things. If anyone, any of you ever had your like fingers ripped out? Um, uh, if any of you ever saw my live lecture, uh, me without gloves, um, three of my fingers on my left, uh, are all mangled because, uh, a Humvee fell on it when I was a kid and it ripped all of this out and uh, it took a while for the nail to grow back. It took like, I think a year and uh, it made my, my fingers hypersensitive and it, and it hurt to, to, to bang into things and touch things. So the nail and the nail bed is really important. And you could also see the importance of cutting your nails in a clinical setting. You shouldn't have this white zone here right here, because you could see how it's easily a point source for uh, infection, right? Let's say you scratch yourself, you have all that Staphylococcus aureus bacteria all over where you scratched and it could get underneath here, which is not good. And also, you got long nails, it's gonna puncture your glove. That's never good. Sweat glands, sebation glands, we already talked about that and the sweat the sweat when it comes out is sterile, but like all things, if you put water and let it hang out in a warm, dark place with a lot of bacteria, which is your armpits and which is your, uh, you know, uh, your groin area or behind your knees, it's going to smell, right? So, um, you know, uh, if your patient uh, either is, uh, doesn't have access to, uh, uh, to hygiene or they're in a um, um, what do you call that? Uh, mental disease or defect, uh, and they don't they don't bathe, they don't wash. That's why they smell, because again, when you sweat, right, that water is sterile. But after a while, that water uh, will get um, will mix with the bacteria. It's in a dark, warm area. That means it's going to grow things, other things, other than uh, just Staphylococcus aureus, and then it'll smell. And it's also the same thing with, remember we talked about how our uh, sweat glands uh, act as a filter. It also, the, the things you eat, right? Uh, you eat a lot of garlic, are you gonna smell like garlic? You eat a lot of uh, spicy foods. Let's say you go to your, uh, your, your favorite uh, uh, Pakistani restaurant, right? Or a favorite Indian restaurant where they have a lot of spices. What are you gonna smell like when you get home? 
or later. Because even even you you, you take your clothes and uh, take a shower, it's gonna you're gonna smell like uh, like what you just ate. Protection, sensory. We were talk, talked about sensory, and the sensory. We already showed you the uh, Pacinian uh, corpuscle, right? Which was deep, and the Meisner's, which is tactile, which is closer to the top. So that's light touch. So you have deep touch, right? Which is vibration and pressure sense. And what do I mean by pressure sense? You ever play that game where, you know, with your siblings or with, uh, you know, maybe somebody in, uh, uh, somebody in your class when, when you were kids, where you're like, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, but you can feel them. Um, that's also part of what they call galvanic skin response uh, because your, your, nerv your nervous system can sense, can sense different pressures. And you guys know that when you go when you go outside, right about right before it rains, don't you feel like the air is heavy? And your Pacinian corpuscles uh, help you figure that out. But light touch, that's your Meisner's. Okay, so Meisner's think light, Pacinian, deep. I the way I remember it is, uh, Pacinian is a P. I turn that P upside down, it looks like a D. D for deep. Yet another thing that the skin does is vitamin D synthesis. Now, remember I told you it also protects you against UV radiation, but the funny thing about skin is it needs a little bit UV radiation to, um, uh, to synthesize vitamin D. Now you can, you can try to drink vitamin D in a pill form or liquid form all day, every day, but the majority of it is gonna end up in the toilet. But you have to expose yourself to a little bit of UV radiation. Um, uh, all my children have vitamin D deficiencies because of uh, the pandemic, because uh, all of them, um, our base of operations is here in the basement. That's where my uh, router is, that's where my server is, and that's where all the computers are. So just imagine you're in school all day. Um, uh, well, my daughter in middle, middle school is now in school two days a week, but now we all now um, have we all now have breakfast, um, especially if it's a little bit warmer, um, out on near the window uh, upstairs because uh, they need a little bit of sunlight, a little bit of UV radiation to increase their vitamin D, because if you don't, uh, um, we know that vitamin D is closely related to um, uh, your bones, and if you're, if you don't get enough vitamin D, your bones will start, uh, will uh, start decreasing in calcium, and then you will start de uh, developing softening of the bones, also known as osteomalacia. Okay, rickets, osteomalacia, vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency. So, the best way to solve that. Um, anywhere from the hours from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, uh, 30 minutes just outside. Or if we're in neonatal ICU, uh, we got heat lamps uh, um, that will expose baby to UV radiation. You know, those little bassinets that they have. Now, diseases, and we're not going to go over the diseases, so I think we're good. Because this is not a pathology class. This is anatomy and physiology. So right off the bat, look here and at home you could look at all these uh, these are nice I, I, I love these these videos uh, they're really nice so let's let's look at did we talk about uh, sweat glands did we talk about thermoregulation yes we did did we talk about all the layers and all the functions yes we did um, and now we got to talk about the aging process so let's uh, take a moment and watch this video this video will help you understand why your skin ages, what you can do to slow down the process, and how to reduce the signs of aging you may already have. One of the primary reasons we age so differently is due to genetic factors. Just as genes from our parents determine our hair and eye color, they also determine how we age. Your genes control several natural processes that cause your skin to age. Let us take a closer look at some of these different factors. 
Your skin is constantly renewing itself by shedding the old and damaged outer cells of the epidermis and replacing them with newer cells. This process keeps our skin looking fresh and revitalized. The lower layer of skin or dermis contains collagen and elastin fibers that also provides the skin with structure, support and elasticity. Beginning in your mid-twenties, the skin cell renewal process slows down and your skin becomes thinner and more prone to damage from external elements like the sun, harsh weather and pollution, producing a dull, rough or uneven texture to the skin. Also trauma. Um, you'll notice that, uh, uh, that when you get older, um, um, any cuts or bruises, they don't heal as fast. Um, when I was, you know, when I was uh, uh, in grade school, you know, you get a scrape or a cut. By the next day, it was already resolving. Um, I got a couple of cuts on my arms that um, uh, that aren't healing too well. And also, if you also have a uh, overlying um, pathology like diabetes, that thin skin is not uh, uh, is more prone to infection and, and also trauma. And that's why when, um, you know, diabetic patient, we're always doing foot patrol. We're always looking at their feet, seeing if they have any aberrant cuts or, or wounds that aren't healing. Uh, it's because not only because it, when you get older, thin skin, uh, also if you have um, a comorbidity such as diabetes, it's going to make things, uh, make things worse. Also, not, they mentioned genetics that can also, um, um, you know, speed up the aging because maybe, you know, um, there are there are certain people on this planet, you guys, that that you guys know. I have some classmates that they haven't aged a day in the last 21 years, um, and and me in the last four years, I, 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 my face and my skin have changed drastically, right? Again, that's not only genetics has to do; it also has to do with your levels of stress in your life, right? And also um, how, much, how much exposure to trauma, how much exposure to the elements you have. In addition, the collagen and elastin fibers within the dermis begin to break down and diminish. So fine lines and wrinkles appear and the skin starts to sag. Lastly, the lipids, or natural fat, that protect the skin's surface against water loss, break down in response to changing hormone levels. The skin's natural moisture barrier therefore becomes leaky and allows water to escape, which is why your skin may become drier with age. Environmental factors can accelerate the normal aging process. Repeated long-term sun exposure is the primary cause of premature aging. Ultraviolet light from the sun causes melanocytes to produce too much pigment or color, which results in the formation of freckles and age spots. Damage from sunlight also accelerates the breakdown of collagen and elastin in the dermis. This is why people who spend a significant amount of time outdoors without proper protection usually experience deeper lines and wrinkles and greater skin laxity. Mechanical factors also contribute to skin aging and include gravity and repetitive muscle movements. This is why people who have very expressive faces tend to have more lines around their eyes, mouth, and on their forehead. If you have maintained a good skincare routine and avoided substantial sun exposure, your skin should look and feel beautiful in your 20s and your 30s. Using a daily moisturizer with sunscreen and continuing to exfoliate will help keep your skin looking radiant. Signs of aging become increasingly apparent in your 40s and 50s. Although your skin can still look healthy and vibrant, the effects of long-term sun exposure, repetitive facial expressions, and the normal aging process start to accumulate. The fine lines around your eyes deepen, and forehead lines and glabular lines may begin to appear. Age spots and other pigmentation irregularities generally start to appear in sun-exposed areas. If you would like to reduce the appearance of facial lines and wrinkles, non-surgical treatments like hyaluronic acid fillers may work well for you. Before you decide on any medical treatment, consult your medical aesthetic practitioner. Now, do you notice that they didn't say rub keratin or collagen all over your face? No, they didn't say that. Did they say, hey, maybe I should uh, stick these chemicals like Botox to decrease these lines? Because remember, there's muscle underneath the skin 
and that's what's tightening all this stuff up. Uh, uh, and uh, they didn't say that, and no no physician in their right mind will will say that. But they they kept on saying decrease exposure to the sun, um, um, and also uh, the one thing they also failed to mention is is like decrease stress because if it goes, if you're scowling or, or, or you're super expressive all day or angry all day, what's going to happen? You know, you know that thing, what they said when, when you were a kid, uh, maybe your parents said this or your friends said this to you, like, um, stop making that face because it will, you know, uh, it, it might be permanent, you know, uh, remember that, um, that wives tale where like, if, if you're making a funny face and someone slapped you on your back, you'd, you'd, um, uh, your your face would be stuck that way. Well, it goes, you know, they're wives tales, but many wives tales and many things like that have have some background in truth. And the truth is that skin, just like the rest of your body, have to take care of it. And uh, did they say use the high end moisturizer? No, just hydrate. And that's that's also another thing. Uh, hydration. Most um, uh, a lovely report about 10 years ago, and I don't believe it's changed much, and I could, I could uh, research it for you if you'd like. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a report talking about the dehydration of Americans, because most Americans, were like, uh, they don't drink water, right? Um, and they don't drink enough of it. And um, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine was, uh, was um, you know, was asking for some ridiculous number, like two gallons a day, or something like that. Um, but when I really think about it, how many glasses a day of water do I drink? Not that much. Um, and juices are diluted. Uh, uh, Soda is not good that, because it's a diuretic. Coffee is not good. That's also a diuretic. And uh, a diuretic will tend to uh, dehydrate you. But basic uh, care of your skin and monitoring of your skin and all, uh, and, and all the stuff that we're, we're talking about here, uh, will help decrease the aging uh, aging process. And surgery is not the thing because every time I cut into my skin, what will you create? You'll create scars. The scars may not be apparent here on your top layers, but they're definitely in your subcutaneous layers every time you cut into the skin. Um, that's why I get real nervous when my patient has multiple surgeries and surgery wants to do yet another surgery in the same area. Uh, I get a little bit nervous. Because remember, um, I was an internist. I was uh, part of the Department of Internal Medicine. And the way that things work in the hospital is the, internal, the Department of Internal Medicine does the pre-admission testing. The surgeons do the surgery. And then um, uh, when they go in the post-op, uh, medicine takes care of them. So I see the before and after effects um, uh, of what surgery does and it's not always pretty. And just as a little side note, if a surgeon tells you you have two weeks to recover, double it. Um, um, or, or if it's like, uh, like something serious like back, like uh, back or spine surgery, um, call it a day, you ain't going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, heck, call it at six months, uh, and also you'll have another six months of uh, um, uh, physical therapy on top of all of that. So, invasion by pathogens. Now we're in lesson one, and we're going to look at uh, look at some of these videos. Actually, we kind of went over this. Uh, don't go over the bacterial identification lab. We went over a lot of bacterial stuff in anatomy and physiology one, and here's where your application assignment is. Um, clotting, nice to know. You can watch that video, uh, uh, video on your own. But let's look at this video here to close up today's lecture. Um, it's this middle one regarding mucous membranes, cilia, and tears. Remember we talked about uh, right when we started this lecture that skin is not the only uh, innate immunologic uh, barrier that we have. You have cilia, tears, mucosal lining, right, your mucus, and those also contribute to your immune system. So let's play this. But germs can enter in other ways. 
With each breath, for example, pathogens can enter our bodies through the nose and mouth. But there is a second line of defense. Mucous membranes in the nose, throat, and bronchial tubes can trap pathogens before they reach the lungs. And hair-like cilia in the bronchial tubes and trachea can sweep them upwards so that we can then cough them out. Tears also provide a defense by flooding and washing away pathogens that get in our eyes. And now, before we leave tears, tears also have enzymes. It's not just water or saline. Because remember, uh, the fluid in our bodies is uh, normal saline or NSS, normal saline solution, which is 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Uh, that's why your tears taste salty. Um, but also in those tears are uh, enzymes which, um, uh, which kill off any bacteria uh, in any foreign body that uh, floats around in your eyeball. Have you ever looked at the sun and then close your eyes real quick, like you, maybe you're at the beach and um, there's, you see these little like bacteria-like things floating around? Well, that's, that's what's floating around in your tears and your tears have enzymes to go deal with those guys or guys or... Um, potential pathogens should eat something contaminated with bacteria gastric juice a powerful acid in the stomach can kill them and and no matter how well you clean your food or how well you brush your teeth uh there's a lot of bacteria there's nastiness here in the oral cavity that's why the gastric juice in your stomach is a ph like uh like 1.1 1.2 on the ph scale which is very, very acidic, meaning to say is it, goes, it will react and uh, uh, with hydrogen ions with everything and uh, uh, make sure that, you know, that bad street taco you just ate, all the bacteria in it or all the bacteria here from your oral cavity gets taken care of. Okay, here's this lovely picture here. Do you see the mucosal lining here? It's thin. It's not thick. If it's thick, then we're going to have a hard time breathing because this is our trach, okay, or a uh, part of our, bron uh, our bronchus. So you have these little cilia. So foreign body viruses, even viruses, no matter how small they are, viruses still get trapped in here. So the cilia then move all of this stuff back up, right? And then so our patient can either, you know, spit it out or cough it out or sneeze it out. That's why if you cough or sneeze into your tissue paper, you make sure you dispose, dispose of it. And also for future reference, when you're in the, like, let's say you're, you're, you're throwing away garbage or something like that at work uh, or sanitation didn't, sanitation or um, what they call environmental, environmental services, every hospital has a different name for it. Uh, the people who clean up the rooms, if they don't get there, right, make sure you glove up, mask up, because um, um, this mucus, when it dries, it sometimes floats around uh, airborne up to almost 48 hours. Uh, so it's never a good thing. So now you can see how the mucous membranes, cilia, which are those little finger-like projections that push all the mucus up, and tears are also your first line of defense, along with your skin, for non- specific innate immunity like there's no it, it, it doesn't think it just it just acts like a good barrier okay with that said it is at this time of the show where i stop